And so what is culture? Well, there have been books written on culture. There's one book that's written in the 19, I guess it was 50s. And it's a couple of hundred pages of definitions of the word culture. And there are lots of different definitions. They all have coincidences and alliances and overlaps and things of that sort. So they're, they're not so different over time in some way. But, but getting a hold of what culture is, that's hard. So when students sometimes say to me, but you, you're not even giving us a definition for the central concept. So I can give you one comes from Geertz, 1973. He was influenced by Talcott Parsons, who was influenced by Max Weber, who was influenced by the entire tradition of German philosophy. I can give you that. And the definition is, and this is his language at the time, so I'll repeat it as it is, culture is a web of significance man himself has spun. Man, of course, meaning humans. It's a, it's a web of meaning. We create it. There is a physical reality. There is a real world out there. I can't go through this just because I don't want to believe it exists. If it's in my way, I'm going to learn to live with it. Yeah? Can't get through it just because I feel like it. So there's a physical reality out there. The question is, what's the sense I'm going to make of that physical reality? How will that matter? How will I see it? And will I see it the same way all the time? So let's say this is a wall, OK? This is a wall. And so if I'm on this side of the wall and I hear something, noises and something coming, uh, hideous growly noises or something on the other side, I think, oh, a wall, protection. I am at least somewhat safe because I have this wall here. If I'm on the other side, <laughs> then what this was is a barrier, right? It's the same thing. But I'm making an entirely different sense of it on one side of the wall or the other. That's what culture is like. It's not necessarily that it makes an entirely different sense, but you can't know what somebody else's sense is. So culture is like love. Hard to define, but once you get it, you get it. And you know what that is, and it lives in yourself. And you can understand it from other people because you're listening. So, I'm going to tell you two stories. And you notice the theme of storytelling? It's because we know as anthropologists that's the oldest way that humans, humans learn. It's the best way that humans learn. We still know that. The species brain is the species brain for 90,000 years. This is not new. It's a different version. Especially mine is not so new. But, but, but it's a different version of a species brain. But the version, and maybe 120,000 years, 90,000 years ago, we are what we are. The brain itself hasn't evolved, in so far as we can tell. You want to see evolution at work? Go and take a look at the, at the, the feet of, um, of an ostrich. Ostriches don't fly anymore. They were originally big birds, and they don't fly anymore. But they can sure run fast. So they can run as fast as hoofstock. They can run as fast as zebras. Yeah? And so they, can, they can't fly, but they can run. And if you can get close, and don't get too close, because they're not really nice. And they don't really like you. And, but, but if you can get close enough, you'll see that those claws are getting a sheath of nails over it. You can't watch for a day. That's not going to work out. Get a really old picture, like from 5,000 years ago or what. You can't, but you can, see, but, but you can speculate based on what we know about evolution. They're becoming hoofstock. That's evolution. And you can see it, not in its play out, but in, its, in one of its stages. So from the standpoint of this kind of brain, we know that storytelling, that providing meaning for things, is where life lies. It's where the meaningful life lies. It's how we treasure experience. It's how we make sense of ourselves and of others. So I'll tell you two stories really quickly about, about culture, but from very different standpoints. One is a story of a simple interaction at a table. Because one of the things that anthropology is interested in is everyday life. 
everyday life. We do a lot of observation, and it can be really tedious. But if you put it all together, it's rich. So one of the things, uh, so the, here's a story. It may be apocryphal. I've heard it several times. I think I even saw it in a textbook once. But the meaning of the story is here what matters. So there's a story of a Hungarian professor who grew up, who lived in Hungary, grew up in Hungary, but spoke English, learned to speak English there, and had been to the United States several times, and was invited to be a visiting professor in the United States for a period of a year. So he comes to the United States, and he has a graduate class, and he invites, as is not all that uncommon, the graduate class to come to his home for dinner. So they come to his home for dinner, and one of, one of, the students happens to be an international student from Japan who had arrived very recently, had not spent a long time in the United States, and, but could speak English well enough. So one of the things uh, that happens at the table is everybody's eating, and uh, after, people have kind of cleared their plates once, and then the professor says, well, would anybody care for some more? Well, you know the answer to this. There, there is a variation of answers which is actually diametrically opposed. Yes, I would, or no, I wouldn't. When somebody asks you if you want something extra, you don't say, you know, or a little bit of more, you say, I don't know, maybe, I can't decide. You don't do that when you're a guest in somebody's house, so it's yes or no. Generally followed by a phrase that includes, if you're a guest, it's delicious, but I can't have any more because I ate so much, or it's delicious, so can I please have some more? And so second helpings are served. After the second helpings, the professor's wife said, well, would anybody care for a third helping? You know the answer to this if you've lived in America. And so I'm not allowed to, I don't think, ask you if you know the answer, but I know you do. Because you know that you're not going to say yes again. There's going to be no third helping in a household where you don't know the people well. No, thank you. Even if you're starving, no, thank you. But the Japanese student says, yes, please, thank you. His plate is cleared. The professor says, would anybody care for some more? The Japanese student says, yes, thank you. So the end of the story is that he eats so much that he's ill, and he passes out with his face in the plate. So what happened? What happened? It's a cultural collision, small scale at a dinner party. Because in Japan, it's incredibly rude to not accept something when it's offered at the table. Incredibly rude. So you would never say no thank you to somebody who's a host, especially maybe a professor. But in Hungary, you always ask, because that's the job of the host and the hostess, will you have some more? Well, in Hungary, they don't take more than one or two servings, as is the habit or the culture here. But in Japan, it's different. That's culture at work. Small scale, fine grained, although pretty obvious after a while. So that's a kind of story that tells you something about the everyday behaviors and how we can misunderstand other people. So you can imagine some of the other students. What a pig. I can't believe he's having more. What's the matter with that? All of this is not about who he is. It's about what cultural meanings are. A quick story. And I'll give you the reference, because I always think you better get the reference. I mean, that's the academic job. So it's Paul Stoller, 1980, in an article called The Phenomenology of Songhai Space. So he is doing work among the Songhai, which is a group of people who live in, uh, in Western Africa. So he had been there before as a Peace Corps volunteer, and he went back then as, a, as later as an anthropologist. And he's doing what anthropologists often do, sometimes just to uh, give themselves some comfort. So they start mapping the space. That gives you a job. You don't have to talk to anybody right away. You can just map the space and then figure it out later. 
So he's, Paul is a sociolinguist. So he finds some buildings and he can't understand why they, were, why they are where they are. They don't make sense to him. So that's called in sociolinguistics. They refer to things that don't make sense to them as noise in the system. So here they have some noise in the system and they're, and, and they're upset about it. He's upset about it. I can't figure this out. So he starts to ask people, and he's not getting the kind of answer that makes sense to him. He asks a French anthropologist who had been there for, uh, in that area of the world for 25 years. And the French anthropologist basically says to him, you know, I just realized there's no word for intersection in Songhai language. That's what he says to him. So now Paul has to think. He doesn't have to actually. But he does, because he's a good anthropologist. So he has to let go of the ways in which he sees space and the ways in which it makes sense to him. And he has to figure out how the Songhai are making sense of space. So he says, he starts asking, and he realizes he doesn't know the word for intersection. And here's the village. And here's the intersection. And he doesn't know the, he doesn't know the word for it. So he says to them, you know the place where two roads cross? And they say, well, no, no. Well, you know, like at the end of the village, the place where the two roads cross. Mm, no. There's a big tree there. Oh, yes, we know the big tree. That's where the two roads cross. Uh, no. So then he goes with a group of them, and he's standing right here. And he says, OK, pals, we're now standing in the place where the two roads cross. It's an intersection. He has to say two roads cross. They say, what are you talking about? Uh, we don't, what are you talking about? So Paul really has to work. And he does. And this is what he figures out. The phenomenology of Songhai space is about letting go of your own categories and learning the ways in which other people see the world. So in Songhai space, there are no intersections. There are no places where two roads cross. What there is in Songhai space is when you get to the end of the road, oh, how embarrassing, your nose sticks out. OK, so when you get to the end of the road, here's the road, well, it's a fork in the road, literally a fork in the road. Now, you may not believe that. I'm asking you to see it, to see that it exists possibly. I will tell you there are no intersections. They're all in your head. They're all culturally constructed. Space is an entity, and the human brain imposes a sense on space on relationships, on life, on meaning. And it's different culture to culture, although some of those paths may, in fact, cross. But you can't take that for granted. Culture lives way down low. You learn it as you breathe. You don't learn it from a book. You can't get it from a book. You've got to watch it. And mostly, you have to open your mind to the possibility that other people are living very meaningful lives that are very different from your own. And so I think that what anthropology is, and it's actually why I love it, you could like it a little, <laughs> is that it's seeking to figure out who we are, what we mean, and how we can survive. Because we have a lot of evidence that we're not smart enough to do that if we don't think about how really smart we are. That if we keep taking much of the world for granted in the way we do, whether it's the climate or the people next door, anthropologists think that humans won't understand that we are a species that has really <coughs> interesting attributes and that we are all the same species, regardless of the color or the song or the, the everything else, until something horrible or just very, very different comes from one of these other planets that we just heard about. 
Yes. Then all of a sudden we're all going to be going, oh, we're so much alike, let's save each other, or maybe you can save me. We're not going to be looking for our differences, which are so small. We're going to be looking at our commonalities, which are so bright. So what we're looking for, I think, is a way to survive not each other but ourselves. A way to get a grasp on what it means to be human that leads us not along some yellow brick road because that guy behind the curtain is interesting and maybe he's all there is. I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that we all have special capacities that talking about things like STEM, sure, why not? It's part of the capacity of the species. Do we know that there are going to be a million jobs in STEM? No, we have no idea. We're, we're, we're in a, a change in mode of subsistence. Anthropologists can tell you that. This is the seventh one we've had. And they come faster and faster. We don't know where the jobs are going to be. But we know that we have to survive long enough to try and get them. So what we're looking for, I think, I hope what we're looking for, is an understanding of humans that takes us to an age of humanity.